This conference will now be recorded. Excellent. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us for this, um, the, the first in the 2021 CPSG webinar series. And I'm delighted to um, introduce Dr. Nikki Mitchell, who's senior lecturer at the University of Western Australia, um, whose interdisciplinary research focuses on physiological ecology, and her and her wider team have been looking at the capacity of threatened species to be able to adapt um, to uh, environmental change. And um, today, uh, Nikki's going to be uh, giving a, an overview of quite a long-term project, a decade-long planning and trials project for assisted coloniz colonization of western swamp turtles in southwestern Australia. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nikki um, so she can introduce herself and uh, then we can get started. And oh, actually, sorry, one thing in terms of communications if you use the chat box for any questions you might have um, at the and then what we'll do is if it's a clarifying question I'll, I'll interrupt Nikki at appropriate time um, if it's one that would make sense to ask at the end of the talk then we'll save it for the open discussion which we'll, we'll have then when, when Nikki finishes. And at that point as well, people can turn on their mics and we can queue people up to ask questions directly. Okay, Nikki, over to you. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks everyone for joining this first webinar for the year. It's, it's a kind of strange not seeing anybody on screen, but I think you can all see me in the corner. Uh, so as Jamie said, my, um, my training is as a physiological ecologist. So I actually started out working on terrestrial reading frogs in various parts of Australia, including frogs under the snow and frogs in sort of arid zone. And then in about 2000, I went to New Zealand to start work on a, a very special population of Tuatara. If you've never heard of them before, you probably should have, because they're um, a lineage of reptiles that's only represented by one species in New Zealand. And, and I was working on a population that was um, very male biased, and we were worried that climate change was gonna make it increasingly male biased because to Atara have temperature dependent sex determination. And this population was um, gonna basically hot temperatures made male offspring. So we did some, pop I did, this is basically where I sort of learned my straps in how to do mechanistic modeling and population viability modeling. And I guess I started to think about what options we might have for helping these populations persist through rapid climate change. And this I, I, the population was an island. So it was obviously gonna need assistance to be um, to, to be able to occur anywhere else, we would have had to physically translocate it. And I guess as I was sort of writing up that research, um, assisted colonisation was starting to appear in the conservation literature as a really hot topic. So I guess my early thinking about it was really based on worrying about sex ratio skews in Tuatara. But lately I've been working on this species in, in Australia called the Western Swamp Turtle, where we're not worried about sex, sex at all, we're actually worried about running out of water. And I've also been, um, we're also working on a project on Christmas Island, looking at assisted colonisation of, of an extinct in the wild skink that's probably um, banished due to an invasive snake, but there've been translocation trials about 400 kilometres away to an island called the Kirkus Keeling Island. So I guess I'm broadly involved in a few different um, projects on reptiles and relocating them for various reasons. But I'm gonna focus on this one case study. And I guess I realise that my, my title of my talk is a little, um, misleading. Um, it was sort of implying that we have learned all we need to learn about assisted colonisation in Australia and of course it's very very early days so it's really going to sort of focus on what we're learning so far on this in this project and what I guess our key sticking points are for going forward. So just to introduce this species as Jamie was mentioning before you guys came online these things look very hefty on its back it's actually they're not that big it's because the turtle is tiny this is a little um, six centimetre or so juvenile it's um, it's a species that lives for about as long as a sea turtle, around about 100 years. Um, it's been variously called the world's rarest colonian, or that's a turtle, or Australia's rarest reptile. Um, and that's because around sort of 40 years ago, we thought there were about 20 left in the wild. So it's an evolutionary distinct species, its own lineage. It does weird things like is active in winter when most reptiles are far too cold to be active. And it does things like nests with its front legs rather than its back legs. So it's a real zoological curiosity. 
and has been a really high profile species in Australia for conservation. But I'll give you a bit more of its backstory as we progress. But just to remind you what we're talking about, um, I think many of you might have seen Phil Seddon's talk at the end of last year in this webinar series, and he reviewed um, the conservation or IUCN's conservation, sorry, translocation um, methods and, and principles and different types of definitions. And one of the definitions he would have covered was assisted colonisation. You might also know of it as assisted migration or managed, re, managed relocation. But its key points are that it's an introduction of a species outside the area where it's known to occur historically or its indigenous range. And the movement is motivated by the belief that you're trying to avoid a threatening process in the core original habitat. Something you think perhaps can't be mitigated, but you can avoid that threat by relocating the species outside its indigenous range. So this idea has actually been around for some time. As it, in the literature, if you look back about the mid 1980s in Australia, people were writing about um, the greenhouse effect and people were starting to recognise that we might need to relocate species between national parks. But it really got sort of going around 2008 with a lot of literature that came out in the conservation science journals both advocating for this as a possible thing we should be doing for some of our more high profile species and also really pointing out the risks of introducing species into novel habitats. And of course, you know, this cartoon is a famous example of, of that sort of movement personified where you know polar bears from the northern hemisphere may have ultimately have no habitat. And maybe it would be deemed acceptable to move them to the southern hemisphere where they'll interact with penguins, which they've never occurred, co-occurred with. And as such, a predatory species introduced like this would obviously have a serious effect on, on the species it preys upon. But I'm going to kind of take you on a journey from sort of the papers that came out in 2008 when I was sort of thinking about Tuatara to where we're at, I guess, not that long after is in eight years where we started trials of assisted colonisation of this Western Swamp Turtle. So it was written up in science. It was a bit of a news or media splash at the time that we did this release because we think it was the first example of assisted colonisation of a vertebrate in the world that was motivated by climate change as the threatening process. Because I guess that's what assisted colonisation, when we mostly think about it now, we're thinking about it as a response to rapid climate change and recognising that a lot of habitat connectivity is lost and that species can't necessarily naturally disperse because there's no intermediary habitat or because they're simply not going to be able to disperse quickly enough. And so the journalist who wrote this article, uh, she interviewed a few people who work in this field, one of whom said people are going to look at this trial and they're going to be saying, oh, what about my species? I wouldn't want to spin that roulette wheel many times. And then others said it's a bold thing to do and it's a good thing to try. And so I suspect if you signed up for this particular webinar, you might have an interest in assisted colonisation. You might already sit on one end of that spectrum or somewhere in the middle. And hopefully what I'll talk about today will um, help you, I guess, resolve your, your feelings or perhaps leave you just as uncertain as you as you might be feeling now. But I really want to point out, I guess, if you're not from Australia or New Zealand, and I don't really know if anyone is in the room who's uh, maybe a couple, um, maybe translocations of threatened species is not something that's done particularly commonly in, in your part of the world. So, but in Australia and New Zealand, it's pretty common practice. And in fact, we've actually been doing assisted colonisations in New Zealand, at least, for more than 100 years. The very first species was the, the famous kākāpō, which in Fiordland was um, rapidly being approached by, by stoats and rats. And a conservationist called Richard Henry put one onto an island called Resolution Island, or put a population there to try and keep it out of harm's way from predators. And Australia's done similar things, putting a lot of its threatened mammals onto offshore islands. And New Zealand's done a lot of those sorts of translocations for its birds, its, its reptiles, and, and even some of its insects. So we're quite used to doing translocations, and we're quite comfortable with the idea of assisted colonisation, putting things into habitats which have never been known to occur, and we haven't seen anything go particularly badly wrong. And in some cases, it's really been instrumental in preventing extinctions. But what's really different is about what I'm going to talk about. It's an assisted colonisation motivated not by predators as the threat, but by climate change as the threat. So that's kind of, I think, the sort of novel, novel ground that we're heading in. So just a background about this species. I told you a little bit about it already. As I said, it's a long, long lived species, um, but it was actually thought to be an extinct species for a long time. So in 1839, um, one specimen was collected. It just said Western Australia on the tag that was stuck on its leg. So we don't know where it was from. 
That was only about 20 years after Europeans were settling Western Australia, which is on obviously the west coast of Australia. Um, and animals were, um, this specimen was sent to the European museums, it ended up in Vienna and was described by a curator in 1903 as a new genus. But it was thought to be extinct in Australia. But then in 1953, one turned up at a wildlife show in the Perth Town Hall by a teenage boy whose cousin had given it to him about two weeks earlier. He'd, count, he'd found a couple of these things, thought it was interesting and took it along to this show. And people recognised it as this unusual um, turtle with a short neck, didn't know what it was, but it was soon recognised to be this species that was described in 1903. So, fantastic news, and luckily they could find some more of these things. They occurred in this little habitat, sorry, I'm going to go back, this little habitat um, which is called Ellenbrook Nature Reserve. So I'm just going to fly a drone over this sort of metaphorically by clicking a movie, so I hope it flows okay, but just to sort of show you what the habitat looks like. Its habitat was um, only, I guess, it was already very small by the time it was rediscovered because these sorts of seasonal swamps that the species lives in um, where if you drain them, they make excellent agricultural land and they can be mined for things like clay, which were needed for building sort of the um, West Australian um, colony in the early days. And a lot of Perth suburban areas are now encroaching right on this very edge of this habitat. So it's a very small reserve and it's been um, fenced off for about, um, uh, how many years? About for 30 years now to get, protect it from predators. So there's a really strong history of, of species um, conservation actions for this species, many of them first. We think it's the first land preserved for a species in Australia back in 1962. Captive breeding was initiated in um, 1988, partly because the population, as I said, was believed to have got down to only about 20 adults. So it um, took a while to get captive breeding worked out, but once it was um, solved, um, now there's about 900 individuals have been bred by the Perth Zoo's captive breeding program. A recovery team started in 1989. We think that's Australia's first species recovery team. And as I said, they fenced the habitat. That was to keep out the foxes that were predating on this, on this population. Um, and then I guess what I want to point out is that translocations began in about 2000. So the Perth Zoo was having this you know, quite good success with its captive breeding. There was a bit of reluctance to put supplement these natural populations with, um, with captive bred animals but there was a much more interest in establishing extra populations as insurance populations. So initially, recover, um, translocations began, they looked for habitats nearby because we didn't really know anywhere for certain where this species had occurred before, but they sent them to some areas about 100 kilometres north of here. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere and you're worried about climate change, sending a species to the north of where it currently occurs is, is sort of the wrong direction because that's where it's going to be hotter earlier and also in our case, it's where it's going to be drier earlier. So we sort of realised that um, translocations in that direction are probably not the long-term option. We probably need to start looking towards the poles, which is, which is south if you're in Australia. So I'm going to sort of focus what's happened on to, since 2000. Um, and the thing that's really happened in Australia or in our part of the world, which is I'm here in Perth, which is about where that little island is, um, it's become much drier. So this is, the, um, this is just showing you some data of the water that flows into Perth's dams, but it's a really compelling figure, just showing you when we've lost or seen serious step changes in our rainfall. Around 1950, there was a change around 1970, around 2000 and around 2010. And in fact, we've had the most dry years ever, all five of them in the last decade. So that means these seasonal swamps, which are mostly perched, which means that they're filled by rainfall and not by groundwater, um, that means that they don't hold water for very long and that's a real problem for our turtles. So the Western Swamp Turtle, we suspect that these drying climates mean that the young individuals are likely to be more likely to desiccate, basically dry out when the swamps are dry because um, they're often very, very small and vulnerable to, to evaporation. Um, they may naturally wish to disperse and look for better habitat. That's what a lot of species would do when their habitats become marginal. But of course, these areas have been fenced to keep the foxes away. And what you, what's the major problem is that these tiny populations, we really need recruitment, even though they live a long time and they don't need to breed particularly often. We obviously do need to see young coming through the population. And we're pretty concerned that climate change is going to sort of make that much harder. And I guess I'll just show you how this plays out with the, the turtle's annual life history. So hydroperiod, if you haven't heard that term, it just simply means the length of or the timing of the year when the a seasonal system is 
holding water. Um, so in the past, in the 1960s, we think hydro periods, or we know, they were often up to seven months of water in those swamps. And that's when our turtles wake up and they become active. They start entering the water and they start to eat little crustaceans and micro crustaceans and invertebrates. And eventually the swamps become full of tadpoles and that's their diet will switch to a bit more of a tadpole based diet. That's when they're growing. So if they're small, they grow quite fast and they eat furiously in that sort of in that hydro period. The older animals will be looking for mates and mating and females will be trying to eat enough energy to have enough in reserve to commit some of that energy into reproduction in a form of eggs. So that's what a good year for the swamp turtle should look like. But what we've been seeing is, I guess, a lot worse. Oh, yes. And I should point out that the rest of the year is a period called Eastervation. That's sort of the opposite of hibernation. It's dry season, torpor. And again, like hibernation, they reduce their metabolic rates as a way of saving energy. But in the what's been happening recently, like in those last 10 years where we've seen many of these dry years, we get a hydro period of about four months. So that means that the animals are only really feeding for four months rather than seven months of the year. And obviously that affects how big the babies can grow each year and that can sometimes leave them vulnerable to desiccation if they're too small in the summer. And it means females might not have enough energy in reserve to allocate that energy into, into, into reproduction. So that's a bit of background. So I guess I wanted to point out in terms of this is a, a webinar about planning and this is one of the best planned species or conservation programs I think in Australia it's got it's actually in the fifth version of its recovery plan here in 2020 which is um, planning for the next decade first plan was back in 1990 and it was written by Andrew Burbage and Gerald Cookling Andrew was the first researcher to work on this species in the 1960s um, he did his PhD on them and he's still an active member of our recovery team so we're, so the plans were all about I guess predator proofing the reserves, captive breeding, improving that, and increasingly from about 2010, looking at how we can boost the success of translocations. And so one of the major goals of the, um, the 2010 plan, which is this one that's still in force, is to decrease the chance of extinction by creating at least three wild naturally recruiting populations, to get beyond 50 adults in the wild, and to conduct translocations at a fourth site. So there was a clear remake from the recovery team and the state government that manages these plans that we they were very actively interested in looking for sites outside the indigenous range that might support this species. And so that's kind of where I kind of joined the program and the recovery team around then. And um, partly because the recovery plan was so specific in what it was looking for, um, we were able to get a nice uh, research grant from the Australian Research Council to look at methods about how we could help choose the best sites for future translocations of this species, being mindful that we really needed to have um, the climate futures of those sites very much in the format foremost of our mind. We needed to be sure that they have good long hydro periods and have water temperatures that were suitable for the turtles to be active. And the, the group of researchers, there's just most of us here in this picture, but just the thing to point out is that the grant was written by not only zoologists and modelers, but also by a team of hydrologists as well and a geographer. So we actually married a couple of disciplines to try and solve this particular problem. And the problem for us was quite tricky because the Western Swamp Turtle is a, um, because we don't know where it ever really occurred and how widespread it ever might have been, all we know is there's this one location essentially, well there's actually two sites but they're five kilometres away, so essentially that's, that's one location. And if you've ever done um, species distribution modelling and use statistical bioclimatic envelope type models, you'll know that it's you cannot make a model based on two um, distribution points. You can't extrapolate that sort of model with any certainty. And in fact, even using correlative methods to predict future distributions under climate change is risky because you're, you're making assumptions about um, future conditions that might have never have occurred before. So we really had to solve how we could predict where this species might occur using completely different method and it's called a mechanistic uh, species distribution model. And I'm just going to give you the very bare bones of, of sort of how, how it works. Because um, really what we're trying to find is I guess our Goldilocks sort of conundrum is where is just right for the species and obviously recognising that that will shift through time as our climate is shifting as well. But we wanted to sort of find a site that would be just right to try now and maybe be you know fairly sure that it might be might be just right for the species in the much longer term as well. So one of our project team is Michael Carney and many of you might know Mike he's a legend of um, species distribution modeling and mechanistic niche modeling and he 
worked with a guy called Warren Porter who wrote this package called Niche Mapper. He's from the University of Wisconsin. Mike put it into the R programming environment, called it Niche Map R, and he helped us uh, just basically build a sort of model of the fundamental niche of the turtles. That basically tells us, at least from the abiotic perspective, that's its physical environment, where could it persist in Western Australia under the current climate and under a novel climate forced by less rainfall and higher temperatures. So Niche Mapper um, basically pulls in uh, spatially explicit data, which you can get from GIS programs. It has spatially explicit climate surfaces that can be run at resolutions as fine as one minute scales, but you know, one hour or one day is also fine. Um, and from those inputs, it predicts the microclimate at a habitat. So it might be predicting the temperatures below ground where a nest is, or might be predicting the temperature that the animal's active at above the ground. And from that, you then um, you tell the model, you can basically put a behavioural program into the model to explain where your animal should be in that microclimate. And that will solve the animal's body temperature based on information you tell the model about your species. So you need to say how big it is, how heavy it is, how reflective it is to the sun, so how much heat does it warm up. You need to know a bit about when it eats and how its physiological rates vary with temperature. And those sorts of data can be pretty tough to get for a threatened species. But for our case, the Western Swamp Turtle, a lot of work was done in the golden days of physiology, which was around the 1960s. We actually know a lot about its physiology and we know about its metabolic rate. So we actually had a lot of this information and were able to use it to predict the fundamental niche of the species. But the thing we, we couldn't do was we didn't know how to model a wetland realistically. Niche Mapper doesn't, isn't set up to model wetlands. So that's where a hydrology team came in they built models of our Ellenbrook site, which were realistic and showed how the vegetation changed and takes out that water. And to cut to the chase, we were able to make some pretty specific estimates of the microhabitats of this species. And then we could basically put this model metaphorically on the back of a truck and run it through 30,000 different pixels of southwestern Australia. And we could run it with different climate forcings. And what it shows us is where theoretically that species should be able to persist now and under a different climate. So what it showed us was that the south coast of the WA is actually pretty suitable for this species and will be increasingly suitable as the climate gets drier where it currently occurs now. So we started to really, I guess, look, look to about 300 kilometres away as sort of a key area of interest for translocations. Also partly recognising that areas closer to the current site were mostly too degraded to even consider for a translocation. So we did this abstract putting a conceptual model on a truck and running it through a supercomputer to kind of come up with some early ideas about where the species might live. But then of course, the reality is there aren't seasonal wetlands on every pixel of that map. They're only in some locations. And there's gonna be many other things that would influence your decisions, such as ability to control predators, distance to different types of land tenure, distance to roads, those sorts of things. So all these other factors were considered using a spatially explicit multiple criteria analysis package. And to cut to the chase, we basically are able to rank a whole bunch of candidate wetlands. And again, luckily, lots of those wetlands that were highest ranked overlaid nicely with the areas that we think are going to be climatically suitable for this species in the future. So that was good news. So we started to narrow down to some actual specific locations. And then the final thing that's kind of relevant to us is to sort of really try and understand how we might see population play out if it was released at any one of these locations. And a way to do that is to use this um, mechanistic um, concept of, of, I guess, an energy budget for a species. It's called dynamic energy budget theory. There's now about, I don't know, one and a half thousand models for species across the globe that now have a dead model completed for them. Um, it's been a, a theory championed by Buzz Koyman from the Netherlands and Michael Carney, the same fellow I mentioned before. And it's, it's not easy to do. It needs a lot of good empirical data to inform the model. But what it allows you to do is to drive your model with assumptions about feeding and assumptions about its temperature. And with those two pieces of inputs, it can predict where the energy flows into growth, reproduction, maturation, and any excess energy, if you're a female, can be released as eggs. So it can drive this animal's whole life and predict when it reaches reproductive age, how often it's going to produce eggs, all those sorts of things. So Sophie Arnold was our PhD student and she took about seven years to crack this model. It wasn't easy because this animal has this weird estivation, but she eventually got it to work really nicely. And she has, the great advantage was that we had animals that we knew really well at the Perth Zoo. So they, they had really good <coughs> data throughout their life of how they grew when they reproduced. 
But this is just showing you a nice match between the model predictions and in terms of its length and the mass of a female that was born in 1972. And it shows you also when this female was had enough energy in reserve to produce the clutched eggs. So now that we can do that sort of modeling, we can kind of start to thread everything together using this Deb dynamic energy budget framework. And we can say hypothetically, if we wanted to release turtles into these three different types of translocation areas that have all got slightly different temperatures when they east of eight, and slightly different temperatures when they feed, and also different lengths of time for when they can feed and when they're not feeding because they're in east of Asian. We can put all those together to predict whether they're going to do okay if we take them a long way south right now because it might be a bit too cold maybe there's not enough energy in that sort of system or under these temperatures to have enough to produce eggs so this this basically this method shows us that um, we can predict the animal's growth for the first three years at the zoo under the zoo's husbandry conditions this is the size they are when they're ready for release and then using each of these simple assumptions we can sort of show um, how the animal grows and when it reaches its reproductive age, which is about six years in these northern sites. And it's a lot slower to do that in the south here. Oh, sorry, go back to that model. But what it shows is if we did send them to the south, it will be a bit slower growing, but they will and they'll reproduce a bit later in life, but they'll actually probably ultimately grow to a slightly larger size. So we sort of basically um, kept working on all these different modeling methods and we ultimately want to pull it all together and simulate the whole system in a realistic model of a wetland in the south but at the moment we're sort of in a trial stage of translocations and because I think what we've done is we've been talking to our recovery team once or twice a year and explaining the research publishing a lot of the research in peer-reviewed um, journals and I think that's given the recovery team enough confidence to say well let's with our next bunch of animals that we've got ready for a release let's try some of these southern sites so I'm just going to now go through the trials that um, we have started in 2016. So this is that first trial that was, was written up in that science story where people said, you know, this is something that you really um, have to think quite hard about doing. But I want to emphasize that some of the media you might see about this story is about, it might read as though we're relocating the animals from the natural population somewhere else. We're certainly not doing that or even considering that. What we are doing though is taking the ex situ um, animals, those that are in bred in captivity, and they're the ones that we're trying to release into these new areas. So Perth Zoo, this is, this is an example of their old husbandry scheme. So they've got little hatchlings um, every year, maybe 60 or so are produced. And then about every year we have about that many for release. And they need to be released when they're a certain size that's large enough to give them a bit of a survival advantage. And as you'll also see, they have actually, actually have to be big enough to carry some gadgets on their back as well, because they're quite small animals. So in the first trial, we had 36 animals and we tried, we basically wanted to look at the northern site that we already released them to for about a decade. And we wanted to try two of these spots that we discovered in the southwest that looked pretty good for the, for the um, in terms of similar habitat to the sites in the north. And they're going to be called East Augusta and Mira. And there was a master's student of mine, Alex Jandra Bruma. She was the one who did all the hard work. So she, and so did um, Gerald Kuffling. He worked on the northern population and together they put their data together and monitored the, the sites every couple of weeks, recaptured every individual as much as possible. Although we did have some trouble keeping the transmitters stuck to their backs, um, but we got a fair bit of data. Um, so Alex sort of radio tracking them every few weeks and, um, and then weighing and measuring them. So this was just a short trial and we got it approved by the West Australian government. We put it through a translocation planning process that the government um, conservation agency runs. It's based on IUCN translocation planning guidelines. Um, and one of the rules of our trial was that we had to catch everything at the end of the trial and take it back to the zoo while we re while we basically evaluated our results. So I'll just sort of show you the quick results of this trial, um, which we just published recently. What actually happened was that we got, um, as expected, we saw the animals not grow very much at the beginning when they're released, because they're released in winter, which is August, September. That's very cold waters generally in these swamps, so they don't do much because they're quite inactive. As soon as the swamps warm up, they start to become active and forage. So we saw reasonable growth at Moore River and then the water dries out. In the two southern sites, East Augusta and Mirup, we saw quite different results. They essentially didn't grow at one site at Mirup but they grew late but well at East Augusta and in fact achieved the same size at, before they went into East Ovation as they did in the north. And that was because essentially they had 40 extra days in the swamp, which meant they had 40 extra days to, to eat. So that was a pretty positive 
result from the first trial. So we went ahead with a second trial a couple of years later. Again, another student did all the hard work, this is Siobhan and Paget. Um, this time we tried a different type of tag because we were starting to worry about animals in the southern sites. We, we did suspect we're going to spend quite a lot of their day warming up before they could feed. And if that time budget was quite substantial, if it took them till say three in the afternoon to get warm enough to eat, maybe there's not enough time left in the day to eat enough to grow. So we really wanted to sort of use new tags that could tell us a bit more about behaviour. So we stuck this tag here, which is which is mostly designed for marine species. It hasn't been used much on freshwater species. It's called a data storage tag and it's made in Cambridge in the UK uh, by a company called Cephas. And um, it basically logs temperature, the pressure, and whether or not the sensor is wet or dry. And those three signals, which was logging every minute, could tell us if the animal was in or out of the water, how deep in the water was, and we could actually work out when it was active and inactive. And what's Siobhan, Siobhan's still writing up her work, but what she basically showed is, there's a, as you'd expect, across a 300 kilometre difference in release area, that's, for, that's a latitudinal difference, so strong differences in solar radiation. We did see differences in behaviour and more time basking in the south and a bit less time for activity but not to the point where we really had serious concerns that these turtles couldn't be active in these southern sites right now. So again, I guess that's given us some confidence going forward. Um, but one thing we, I guess to point out is that one trial we did in one location we used twice, which was this site called Mirac, which you might remember was a site that didn't do well in 2016. Well, the same thing happened in 2018 as well. It also, no, very little growth at Mirac. So, We've abandoned Mirup as a potential um, assisted colonisation site, and as many animals as we could find have been returned to captivity, although some were lost because of transmitters um, detaching from the turtles. But the other site did do well. So if you remember East Augusta, we had this good growth pattern here. And the reason we think things went well in 2016 was that there was a really strong difference, not in temperatures of the water, but in the food. So um, there was an Austrian student, Katja Smoltz, who was working with us in those years. She was measuring the biomass at the beginning of spring and the end of spring. Sorry, that's what these two bars are, early spring, late spring. And you can see clearly at East Augusta, there was a lot more food in the water using a standardised method, and it was mostly tadpoles. And these tadpoles are hugely energy rich, and turtles can probably just eat a few weeks of tadpoles and put on enough weight to survive the full full next year. So it seemed to me there was big influence on the, on the adequacy of the food resource at the translocation site that was affecting whether or not these southern sites can work as well. So where we're at now is I guess we're refocusing on this East Augusta area. So I've now got a, a new PhD student who's Bethany Nordstrom. She's been working all of last year um, through COVID restrictions, but luckily we were quite lucky in West Australia and didn't have too many um, travel restrictions or other types of things that affected the field work. So she was able to um, basically evaluate four options for sites in the East Augusta area. She's particularly interested in looking at the adequacy of the food types that the turtle eats. And she's also gonna be developing methodologies that will give us much easier ways of monitoring these translocation trials in the future. So using DNA-based methodologies, she can, she's going to be comparing these physical sampling methods with DNA metabarcoding of fragments of DNA um, that are in these water bodies. And she's also developed a DNA, um, an eDNA marker for freshwater turtles in the southwest of WA, which will tell us which species are occurring in these systems as well. And hopefully will allow us to detect long-term how persistent the Western Swamp Turtle might be if we try and establish it in these novel habitats. So as I said, Beth worked really, really hard. I'm just going to show you some of her data. Um, I guess her main point is she's been trying to work out, have we got the right food types? And are those food types really, really abundant when our turtles are really active? And they're really only active for about, to say, October, November, December. They're pretty resting most of the time because the waters are a bit too cold. But the other thing I'm sure many of you are worrying about is um, what's the collateral impact of introducing the swamp turtle in these pretty pristine, un, unaffected, untouched um, wetland ecosystems, some of which have um, you know, quite high priority uh, conservation status as threatened ecological community. We do have threatened species in these systems. So there's two um, endangered uh, fish. One is a, is a kind of a living fossil type thing. It's called the salamander fish. It's a fish with an articulated neck, which is pretty quirky. So it's a very ancient sort of lineage. 
Um, and it's like the Western Swarm Turtle, it actually also estivates, so it uses these same types of swamps and it spends most of its time in the mud and when the swamps fill up it, it comes out and it has an aquatic life cycle. But we did want to make sure that any places that we were um, releasing swamp turtles, I guess we want to be confident that the impact won't be substantial on the, these threatened fish. And the great thing about Western Swamp Turtle, it's a small turtle as you've heard, but it also does not eat fish. They've tried to get it to eat fish in captivity, it just won't do it, it's got a very small mouth. So we're confident even if it does occur, occur with these species, it won't have an impact. And there are actually one other natural occurring freshwater turtle in these southern swamps which does eat fish and that it does coexist with these two threatened species. So we're pretty sure the most, the only real threatened things in our systems are these two species and we're pretty sure the swamp turtle will not have a, a detrimental effect even if the population grows, um, grows well. So this is um, Bethany, um, she's basically now trying to evaluate between four sites and she's been collecting a whole lot of biological and sort of physical data. This is just a, a flyover which will show us the, um, this is the site that worked really well in 2016, but what you're going to learn now is just how, how small it is. It's, um, it's just a little um, wetland that was nice and close to a road, easy to monitor, but as you can see from this little film, it's right adjacent to some farmland that's not conservation estate, so that's private land. And in 2016, our turtles tended to wander off in that direction and tried to estivate. So it's not a site that we think is ideal for establishing a population, despite it actually being a very successful trial site in, um, in 2016. So Bethany's been looking at um, four sites. Oh, sorry, no, I'll just go back to Bethany's work. She's now really um, getting really good data on the types of species and insects and looking for anything rare in these systems. She's also getting data on the hydro periods, how long the water's being held, how deep the water is, the water temperatures and the pH. We also suspect that the swamp turtle needs to be in these quite neutral waters rather than the really acidic waters, which it was at Murup. But anyway, she's now, she's been evaluating four sites in the southwest over this last, over 2020. And the key things we think that will help us going forward with a decision about where to try next are, are there lots of tadpoles when the turtles are most active? And where are the warmest of these sites? And so we're kind of narrowing down to wetland one and to wetland four. Wetland four is one we found a bit late in the piece, so we've only got data for a few months, but it actually turns out to probably be the best of our options overall. And wetland one is where we worked in 2016. It's not the long-term solution, but we would like to try it again to, as a comparison to wetland four. So just to finish up, I guess what we're, where we're heading next with this project um, is we're writing a translocation proposal right now to be considered. So the recovery team endorses this plan. We're going to propose a large release of maybe, maybe up to 75 or so um, turtles because there's been a lot kind of held back at Perth Zoo for this, this particular project. Um, we're, so that has to be approved by the, the West Australian government. Um, and we'll have certain conditions on what we consider success and failure, various metrics that we've used before. We're going to, Bethany's going to be looking really hard at probably and daily, daily surveys of these populations as they're released, trying to really understand exactly what they're eating. She'll be using things like fecal DNA metabarcoding to look at what they're, what's actually passed through their gut. So we can be absolutely certain that they can't eat fish and we'll make a contrast with the other turtle I mentioned before that does eat fish to see if this this method works because we really want to be sure that it couldn't have an impact on the threatened species if we proceeded. And I guess the final point is we want to sort of move beyond are we still trying assisted colonisation and testing the waters or are we actually ready to sort of let them go in these areas and start to supplement these sites with extra animals each year to try and attempt to establish another population which is admittedly about 300 kilometres south from where we've ever known them to occur. So I wanted to sort of finish with this um, this webinar with Jamie and I would like to sort of have a chat to some of you who might be thinking about assisted colonisation yourself or maybe you're not but certainly the people I've spoken to when I've um, spoken to people from other countries is that maybe the appetite for assisted colonisation is not as strong in other parts of the world. There might be serious policy impediments for going forward or all sorts of reasons but I guess I just want to point out that a lot of effort's been put into putting out decision tools to help us about prioritising which species to go forward with. Um, you can also customise and build decision tools specific to your question like we have for the Western Swamp Turtle. And I guess the other real advantage with um, 
or way to go forward is if you've got an ex situ program to provide those individuals for the translocations, it's probably more palatable than pulling animals out of their, their last bits of habitat. You may have opportunities to restore or enhance habitats in preparation for reintroductions. Um, and that can be a great opportunity for restoring degraded land or, or previously mined areas. Maybe there's a real win there working with industry in the way you could, you could actually create habitats that are ideal and not at then risking um, perhaps in other species that you're concerned about. There's a lot of effort that needs to be going ahead with risk assessments. So that's, I guess, as methodologies emerging on how to do that um, rigorously. And I guess the other key part of assisted colonisation and translocations generally into new areas is that engaging with the, with the local people in those areas and the Indigenous people might really be an important part of what you're doing. So that's something we haven't done a lot of for this project, partly because of the risk of poaching the species is quite high. We haven't really been advertising too much of what we've been doing, but we do recognise that stakeholder engagement is probably time to start taking that really seriously. And of course, raising money to do this sort of research is also a challenge to many of us. But I guess that hopefully you've um, sort of seen this process and, and kind of um, convinced that learning from actually trying these things out is worth a tr worth doing. You can make a lot of models and be, you know, make some, make some predictions about what might happen in your system, but nothing beats actually giving it a go and building what you've learned into adaptive management. So I'll just finish there and acknowledge that I'm just one of many um, people at the university who've been involved. A lot of this work's done by my students and by Gerald Cushing, my main collaborator in the Department of Biodiversity. And of course, the decisions I'm talking about have not been made by me. I don't want to imply that at all. They've been made as a team, as a recovery team, and endorsed by West Australian government to go ahead. So it's not an academically driven project. It's been driven really as a, as a large collaboration. So I'll just wind up there, Jamie. Have we got? Have I talked too long? Not at all, Nikki. Oh, that was that was <laughs> fantastic. A, a, a really engaging, interesting um, talk. If I could ask everybody just to, if you can turn your mics off, if everybody has their mics off for now, and then what we'll do is, say if you if you want to either ask a question, then you can turn your mic on, and I can then I can kind of cue people up, or you can write it into the into the chat. So we're going to come for questions in a second, but I'm going to take advantage of me talking now to ask about this topic of risk um, because it's something that has, you know, I'm um, increasingly conscious of and spending time talking about with groups that are planning for threatened species work. Um, and it's sort of a messy, complicated topic that involves a whole lot of variables um, and concerns. But And I wondered what the sorts of conversations that you've had around going forward there's you you, you sort of said um you know when do we move from a kind of trial to actually kind of properly doing it and that that's yeah. when the kind of the rubber is going to hit the road that's when people have got to decide how much information is enough for us to move forward and i, yeah. and I wondered what sort of what sort of conversations have you had around understanding where people's comfort or discomfort is and to what extent is that biological discomfort or are there other variables that come out that people are concerned about addressing before that red button is pressed? Yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of concerns um, mostly biological but also management so biological first I guess I have had some conversations with fish biologists who are pretty worried that this thing might be so successful that they're um those threatened fish could be threatened um, and I've sort of had to reassure them that we really are thinking about it. We've actually got a, another modelling project I haven't just discussed today, but it's about using food webs to predict how they're disrupted by introducing a new species. And we've also tried to simulate through time what would happen. But anyway, um, the main reason I'm comfortable about the fish risk being very low is the fact they really just can't eat these things. But I guess other problems have been just managing these habitats. As I mentioned, poaching is a problem. So do we need to put fences? How expensive is this going to be if suddenly um, the local jurisdiction has to suddenly have another new threatened species to look after and they're already strapped for resources? This is just another thing maybe they don't need to be doing. Um, managing fire in our landscapes is, is increasingly tricky um, as they're getting drier and drier climates. The risk of fire is going up, but so is the um, expectation from the public to do burning to protect assets. So we've got to be sensitive about people wanting to burn areas that we might be putting threatened species into. Um, 
what other things? I guess the other risk is that we're moving too early and that it is too cold for this species. And we do think it is going to be not as comfy as it is around Perth, but that comfort is offset by having more time to eat and and um, and hopefully high prey availability. But one thing we have modelled that I didn't talk about is how the eggs will go. So we've simulated what happens when females leave those swamps and drop their first clutch of eggs. And we've shown that actually, unless they choose to nest out in the open areas, the nests will probably be too cold right now for the eggs to hatch. So in their current habitat, they tend to go to little shady sites and drop their eggs under a bush. If they do that still down in the south, that will be too much shade and the eggs will be too cool. But if they're plastic enough in their behaviour and choose open areas, the nests will be just right. And we just don't know enough yet about how plastic the turtle's behaviour is. We don't even know much about the genetic diversity of this population and whether there is any. So, um, yeah, there's still lots of things we don't know. And it's 100 years or so this thing lives. It's going to take a long time to understand how successful reproduction might be and how much, I guess, effort we might need into establishing populations. There's still lots to learn. but We've kind of at the point now where captive breeding is going so well and it really isn't appropriate probably now to keep topping up those sites in the north. And we think it's worth, we've actually just had a huge fire burn Ellenbrook Nature Reserve. So 95% of that habitat I was showing you with the drone has been has been torched by a, a wildfire. So we don't think that's killed too many individuals, but it's certainly set that area back a bit. So yeah, there's um there's a lot a lot at risk, but there's also a lot to be gained if this, this happens to work. Sorry, Fantastic. long answer. Thank you. No, that's that, that, that's great. I'll maybe come back to that later on as well. So, yeah. um, Cesar and then uh, and Jamie and then Katerina. Um, Cesar, did you did you have a question you wanted to ask? No. Uh, I'll presume not. Um, so, come to um, Jamie. Good to see you again, Jamie. Did you have a question or is it just because you've got your two mic things, you've got two systems set up? No, I've just got two. Maybe I've got two. Sorry for that, I've yeah. got it on a computer. Well, I, I did actually have a, um, a question. Um, really, really fantastic talk. Um, yeah. Great to see the progress that's been done um, over the many years. Um, I just had a question with uh, the recovery teams and the recovery yeah. um, plans. So you said, um, you know, one of the oldest recovery teams in Australia, and uh, you know, you're on your fifth iteration of that. Now, I suppose this is a question more broadly about recovery teams as a process. Have you found that, um, you know, every every recovery plan, I guess, outlines a whole number of um, objectives? Have you found over time that you've been able to actually? Uh, achieve some of those objectives because I guess um, with with some recovery planning yeah um, you know there's a lot of debate at the moment in Australia whether actually they lead to any action on the ground yeah yeah they've set clear objectives in each plan and, and reported on whether they've been achieved each time and the one that we keep failing to achieve for certain is that there are 50 adults alive in the wild and we we get indicators we can't these this is a population of species it's almost impossible to monitor you can't um they're basically only monitored by randomly finding them again because you, so we have to use something called known to be alive modeling which just takes a while for the data to catch up but yeah basically we're not convinced yet we've definitely got 50 adults in the wild although sometimes we say 70 but we haven't really you know, moved beyond that safety barrier we've, we've seen yes meeting objectives in seeing recruitment at those northern translocation sites um, but and we've seen success and continued improvement from captive breeding um, but I think our ultimate goal is to, is to obviously downlist this to, to a critically endangered species would be painful, but that's probably not something that's on anyone to write for 50 years old. But yeah, we, are, we do set pretty realistic objectives and report on whether they're met. One of our main issues, of course, though, is, is funding for recovery plans. Like if you're, if you're in Australia, you know that very few plans are probably funded. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Thank you. If we didn't have students doing a lot of this work, it's in the box so far. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. And it, it seems, I mean, Nikki, in a way, it is. I mean, you could take 50 individuals, you could drop them out in the wild, and you could go tick, job done. 
Mm. You know, so so in a way, in a way, it seems like a, a, a like a, 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 a my from my naive perspective, like in a way, ridiculously easy to achieve that bit. It's just mm. about what do those fifty end up doing, and uh, yeah. are they sort of meaningfully contributing? Yeah. So there's there's been um, eight hundred or so released. So you'd think we would have definitely ticked off that. Yes, we've got fifty wild adults, but the animals that are released are attract initially. For until they sort of estivate and then the tag falls off because they grow a bit and then they shed their scoots. So we've lost the tag and we don't have the resources of lots and lots of staff to follow every individual. So you don't necessarily know how those animals have gone long term. You may opportunistically see one a decade later, you might find it's bred, which is fantastic. But one question we can't really clearly answer is how many of those released individuals have survived? Uh, and as you know, we've been working on this leatherback project and that's not a, <laughs> that, that question is very relevant to sea turtles as well. You just don't have those sorts of data. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Katerina, and then I'll come to Jose in the chat. Katerina, did you have a question you wanted to ask? No. Okay, um, so uh, Jose is asking about uh, what do you think is the most important achievement this conservation action did to support future assisted colonization translocations with other species? You know, so has it has it kind of has it helped in any way to kind of open up the door to assisted colonizations or thinking about it for other species? I don't know that it has. Um, I'd like to hope it will, um, but I don't really know how many people are aware of, of this project and that's why I was really happy to speak to this this group in particular because it's more of a global audience than perhaps I'm, I'm usually talking with. Um, but as I said in Australia we've, we do a lot of translocations, we're not, not really moving on translocations due to climate change for any other species that I'm aware of, certainly crop, you know, crops and forestry species, all those sorts of things are being relocated, obviously, because they grow better if you do. But um, in terms of conservation species, we're probably more worried about more immediate threats such as habitat loss and predators than climate change for most things. But this species in particular, it's really clear how if we lose more rainfall, it's just not going to recruit. And so, and it's certainly not going to migrate. And so we're either looking at, um, yeah, ex situ populations, which of course will always be possible, but it'd be nice to see them living a, a natural life. Yeah, but yeah, to answer the question, I don't know if anyone does know, <laughs> if anyone else in the audience has any um, views on that, but uh, may, I'd really like to know from anyone who is aware of assisted colonisation trials or projects in other parts of the world. I, I'm, there's certainly been some literature on butterflies and on this sort of very famous tree, the Terea conifer in the US that they've been moving into Georgia from Florida. They're the sort of classic things you'll read about in the literature, but I haven't seen too many. And a couple in uh, New Zealand, I think the he he has been looked at as a, um, essentially also looked at from its climatic needs in the future. But we've clearly running something where it's never been before. Um, that's not so obviously being done due to climate change. And th there's, um, uh, Gerardo's just asking about um, th the sort of thinking about it from a, from a com local community sort of layperson perspective when yeah. sort of these decisions are being made and I, I was wondering as well around that, that, that about you know when you start this isn't, she isn't uh, Gerard, I'll, I'll get to Gerardo's point first he's he's asking about um, um, how you help people to understand why your why you feel the species should go here but therefore not go there um, mm. and particularly if people feel at all connected to the species it might you know feels a bit like well what have they done why why, why are they so special yeah, why, yeah. Why, can't, why can't it come here it's definitely it's going to start getting messier isn't it as you more complex anyway when you when you start yeah. going more public with this and any sort of more permanent project that's right yeah i mean we think there's huge value in put the east augusta is is near sort of a, a holiday residential area um that's really sort of conservation minded people live there which is great and um so we think we would probably ultimately like to have a sort of a, we've got a friends of the western swamp turtle um, group in perth who do amazing work with fundraising and habitat um, improvement at Ellenbrook. It would be great to have an equivalent group down there. But yeah, you're right. Maybe um, maybe the public view won't be positive, or maybe it's a bit like you know we'd like that 
because it could even bring you know tourism or, or um, PR benefits to certain areas by doing something like this. Um, and indigenous, indigenous, the perspectives of the indigenous community are really um, relevant too. Um, we've had um, the turtles welcome to country by indigenous representatives from from southwestern Australia, and I was sort of interested in their views about whether they thought this was a good thing. Clearly, recognizing it was a novel species, and they said for them. A lot of their family, their totem animal is a turtle, a freshwater turtle, is probably the long neck turtle. But for them, the swamp turtle was was close enough and they were happy to sort of welcome their ancestors into, into these habitats. And that's a very small sample of people I've, I've talked to about it, but certainly they were excited and joyous about it rather than being critical. But and, that and what, might be a common view everywhere. What what would be the process in terms of sort of moving to and you know moving from pilot project to a full pro, full grown project? You is it is it purely you sort of the recovery sort of your engagement with the recovery team and central government that would kind of decide on that, and then you'd have to work out how you engage other groups, or does it immediately go to some sort of broader constituent to 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 determine? Yeah, it's entirely the decision of the West Australian government and its um, conservation agency right now. So they've got regional um, divisions in the state. And so partly it's going to have to, if we do go ahead with an introduction into this new area, the local regional team will have to mobilise and become actively involved in that program. And at the moment, there's one dedicated scientist in the government, Gerald Cookling, who is the species expert, has worked with them for 30 years, but he can't be everywhere at once. And so we really need to skill up and have a lot more staff able to sort of look after this program because monitoring this is going to be really hard. Once we lose PhD students who are writing up their, their theses and moving on to the rest of their careers, we can't kind of have a continual pipeline of students ready to do sort of monitoring work. So we need really the state government to be able to do that. And it's obviously a high profile thing if we're going to do assisted colonisation. We can't just do it and then walk away from it. Um, we need to know how it's going. And to, because it is an important experiment for not only Australia, but hopefully sort of globally, that you know, it's something that we're ready to do in certain, in certain situations. Thank you. Um, so uh, anybody got uh, uh, any other questions they would like to ask or comments? Or is anybody working with assisted colonisation yeah. at the moment or been considering that. it? I'm aware of some projects in Europe, I think with cave salamanders in Croatia. I think they're looking at some translocations to the north into other countries that are motivated by concerns about climate change, but I don't know if anyone knows about those projects. Um. I'm seeing no no microphones <laughs> going on, so maybe maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, I was interested as well in the um, the the, the, the modelling software that you would use. That's some combined approach, and I wondered um, when when I'm talking to colleagues in CPSG about the value of PVA and mm -hmm. um, and and they're quite they're quite they, they sort of impress on me the fact that you can do quite useful stuff even with and get useful information out even with relatively few data particularly if you're looking at kind of sensitivity some sort of sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. sort of relative impact of different options and is, is it the case with the sort of the, that combined approach that you you took or is is are those tools really only relevant where you do have that that depth of data no um it's i didn't mention but we have done pva on this project too and i guess the the, the model, modeling types i talked about where very rushed. I didn't know, and I don't expect anyone to understand them. But the the dynamic energy budget tool in particular actually gives you important things for PVA. It gives you reproductive output, and it gives you reproductive age and lifespan. And those, there's no way of knowing that. You'd just be guessing normally in a PVA. But this time, at least, you've got a mechanistic model that predicts what a how a southern population might grow, where it's taking longer to reproduce, perhaps producing eggs less often, perhaps having higher mortality or lower hatching success. If we can determine all some of these sort of, um, I guess, input variables through these other modelling types we use. I think we're a bit more certain about how long it might take or how much effort it might take to establish a population. Um, I'm not sure if that was your question, but um, yeah, it's, I guess, yeah, there's, there's no, um, no real limitations onto how many different types of modelling you can use to answer these questions. I guess it's, it's but it, is, it does get a bit hard to track what each one is doing and why you're using it for what question but um, 
yeah, as I said, our first fundamental question was where to put them and we couldn't solve that using a, a sort of um, standard approach. We had to customise it by simulating a real wetland and a real life cycle of a turtle to show where it's, it could be active. It's going to be. I probably uh, haven't convinced anyone this is easy, uh, and and I'm, I'm <laughs> apologise if that's the case. <laughs> um, so maybe that's why nobody else is doing it. It might be a much simpler question um, for other people who've got a species again where you have got a large distribution, historical distribution to to predict a future distribution. But then it's um, the the political things that often get involved, or the stakeholder um, elements that might get complicated. And, and I think that that's going to be uh, as well as um, hearing as we have today about the, the really fascinating sort of biological conundrums you've been having to to deal with mm -hmm. and how you've overcome them. And also that, you know, this value of sort of adaptive management starting off actually quite early on in the process to sort of play with ideas in a way that you learn mm -hmm. as you're doing. So you're going to be in a better position to be able to kind of do something and feel confident about it to actually press that button um, when yeah. it's when it's really required. And I guess it will be it will be very interesting to be able to come back and hear again how the project is going when you overlay these biological concerns with some of these other concerns that other stakeholders will will have, whether they are in government or whether they're local community. And yeah. you know, looking at those maps at the moment that looking at habitat preference um, or suitability if what you know, imagine overlaying that with some sort of socio-economic cultural yeah. sort of other layers of information that people care about that will ultimately exactly. determine where yeah. things are able to go that I think is going to be um, very very interesting yeah so you can adopt that that spatially explicit multiple criteria analysis we did which was ranking sites based on suitability of the species you could flip that on its head and and ask people about I guess their relative acceptance of the species in their in their ecosystem again see which ones come out more highly but then we'd probably have to run all the biological stuff again to see um, if, if we get an alignment so you could go on indefinitely I guess doing all these types of I guess with assisted colonization there comes a point with when do you actually start trying things out versus testing and thinking everything through um, is, a, is a hard one to answer sometimes we're lucky we've got a species that lives a long time um, and we're lucky we have an ex-situ population to, to learn with, learn from, um, and the funding to support that by the government. We're actually, we're just, just in the meeting, in fact, I'm going back to you after this, we've been looking at a species that is also long-lived, and uh, one of the things that we're doing, they're doing PVA for it, and they've decided to extend the PVA model over, and they're adding on another 50 years, because if they stick to something like 100 years, there's actually, there's pretty good chance it's still going to be around. It's just it's just going yeah. to be a few individuals that are not breeding very much. So you know, with some mm. of these species actually trying to think beyond, uh, you know, well beyond our kind of our own lifespans and sort of traditional lifespans, you think of projects is important to really get a sense of yeah. of, of the trajectory and sustainability of the populations. Yeah, I agree. Um, Nikki, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation um, um, somebody's actually just written probably my first lesson on species conservation so you you started somebody off on the, oh, on, the on, on the on the track so um, thank you so much for that and 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 great uh, uh, you know luck with the with the project um, and it would be great as I say to uh, to be able to sort of check in again at some later point to see how you're doing um, with with moving from the pilot to 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 the yeah, next stage? Yeah, a couple of years ahead when Bethany's data's coming in would be a great time to touch base again. Excellent. Yeah. We'll be hearing from you in February 2020. 2022. Yeah, 2022. All right. Okay, that's good. Right. I've booked you in already. Um, thank awesome. you, everybody, for um, for um, so staying with us as well. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, there will be another one, uh, another. Um, uh, webinar next month and I've now forgotten exactly what the webinar is I can't remember what it is but there is one so go and have a look at the CPSG website and I'll be setting up a, a sort of a, a sign up sheet for that one and we've got a series going through till May June time and then we'll have another one for the rest of the year so um, please do join us again and spread the word and Nikki again thank you so much um, yeah. really insightful great way to start the year yeah. Thanks everyone for your thanks for coming through on the chat and feel, please feel free to write afterwards um, or chat via Zoom, all is possible if you want to know a bit more or if I can help. <laughs>
All right. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks Nikki. Thank All you. right. Thanks, Nikki. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, the other Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Bye. Rodrigo. Bye. People on camera.